I am thrilled to have Pedro Waterton with us today. So after three years as a postdoc, Pedro is now an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen, where he teaches igneous petrology and geochemistry. And prior to this, he did his PhD at the University of Alberta, studying petro Proterozoic. Oh my gosh, why did I do this to myself? Proterozoic Winnipegosis comatites. Close. Oh my gosh. Okay. And yes, I cannot wait to learn from him today about his research on comatites, their geochemistry and origin. So it's going to be an amazing session. Please use the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Pedro, for joining. It's amazing having you here today. Okay, so um, thanks, Jessica, and, and good effort. It was it was really close. It's comatiates, but you 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 battled through protozoic out really well, so that's a good start. And uh, and thanks, Mike, for outing my brick phone. Um, never thought I'd have to show that on a on a talk, but there we go. Um, yeah, so so this talk today is about comatiates, their geochemistry and origins, and it comes from a review paper that I've, I've just written with Nick on, and um, it's it's coming out in a book. Uh, next year, uh, the book's going to be The Archean Earth. It's kind of an, a second edition of the Precambrian Earth. And essentially, when it came to rewriting this, they realized there'd been so much research on the Archean in the past 20 years that they just wanted to zoom in on that. So um, this, this paper and this talk wouldn't have come together without talking to a lot of people. And I put a list of everyone who contributed to our Comartiac discussions on the left there. Um, I'd also like to thank the reviewers of the paper, Claude Hertzberg and Remy Pierru. Uh, the editors, Richard Ernst, Paul Mason, who, who gave me a shot um, despite being early on in my career, and uh, Martin Homan. And a uh, special thanks to um, Christopher Silas, who's my postdoc supervisor, who actually paid me while I was working on this, which wasn't one of his projects. So thanks, Chris. All right. In this talk today, I'll um, first go through what are comatiates, just so that we're all on the same page, and because I think the definitions can be a little tricky. Um, we'll then talk about comartiate geochemistry, particularly the different groups of comartiates. And then we'll basically go through what constraints we have on comartiate formation. So what, what features can we use to discriminate between different models for, for how they formed? And finally, we'll put that all together to come up with some models that hopefully fit all the observations. So what are comartiates? Um, comartiates are ultramafic volcanic rocks. Um, and I think it's one of these things that it's quite easy to intuitively have a feel for what a comartiate is, but it's quite hard to pin down a definition. So early on, um, soon after these rocks were discovered, there was a bit of an argument over whether these were an ultramafic version of a basalt or something fundamentally different. So on the right here, you can see um, three different suggested classification schemes from uh, the, the first comartiate conference. Uh, in A, it's kind of what, what it ended up with is that uh, comartiate, so this ultramafic version of basalt, um, B, you can see this idea that maybe there were different magmatic lineages in Comartia, similar to what we see in less magnesian rocks. And in C, there was this suggestion that maybe Comartia is just their own series. And as a Comartiatic basalt, maybe you can see Comartiatic dacites, rhyolites, all this kind of thing. Um, so anyway, we pretty much ended up with A. And the cutoff between Comartiate and uh, basalts and pickrites is usually set at 18 weight percent MGO. Um, it's pretty arbitrary, but it falls naturally in a, there's, there's not many rocks around this 18 weight percent MGO um, region, so it seems to be like a somewhat natural but arbitrary divide. So what distinguishes Comartiate from other ultramafic rocks, um, particularly pickrites, um, bononites, and alkaline ultramafics like mimakites? Um, so to separate them from pickrites, which might have accumulated a bunch of olivine crystals and artificially had the MGO contents bumped up, um, the definition usually specifies something like they are derived from liquids that had more than 18 weight percent MGO. So this means that the, they were originally ultramafic and not just ultramafic through olivine accumulation. The problem with this is it does get a little tricky. You, you have to establish what the original liquid was, which is a bit messy for a definition. Um, to separate them from bononites, there's a silica cutoff. Uh, this is 52 weight percent uh, silica, or in more recent definitions, it's uh, adjusted for, for olivine fractionation. And to separate them from al alkaline rocks, um, we say less than 1% titanium uh, oxide. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about spin effects texture because this is fairly inter integral to, to how people define comartiates. 
So Spinifex texture are, um, is composed of centimeter to meter sized plates of skeletal olivine or pyroxene. And this, the scale here is quite important. Um, it's random or platy. At the top of flow, you'll typically see uh, random uh, olivine spin effects. And then as you go down into the flow, these grains start to align and you can see it really well in uh, figure A on the right hand side there. And eventually they're parallel or sub parallel. And this is uh, platy spin effects. Um, spin effects grows downward from the flow top. And at the same time in differentiated flows, you're accumulating olivine from the bottom. So the flow is basically crystallizing from the edges and the middle of the flow is the last melt to crystallize. Um, spin effects is not to be confused with um, micro spin effects, which is shown in the uh, figure B on the right there. Um, and micro spin effects shows up in all sorts of uh, picrites, bononites, and, and other ultramafic rocks. And it's not diagnostic of Kamatiite. And again, here is the scale that matters. So, you know, something on the order of 100 microns um, is not spin effects texture. Um, it also uh, can sometimes be confused with uh, bladed metamorphic olivines, and you see this in um, amphibolite fasces donites. Um, basically, the, the rock is serpentinized, and then as it heats up, it deserpentinizes, and you get these very long, randomly oriented olivine grains. They can be up to 20 centimeters long. Um, the key thing here is that those are associated with hydrous metamorphic minerals. And if you're looking really carefully, the metamorphic olivine tends to be elongated along the B axis of olivine, whereas uh, spin effects olivine is elongated along A or C. So do all Kamatiaks have spin effects? Um, no, they don't. There's a, there's a really wide variety of flow styles and actually the majority of Kamatiaks lack spin effects. Um, in greenstone belts where this has been mapped out in detail, it's somewhere around 20 to 40% of flows appear to be differentiated. And I've shown on the right some of the uh, types of flows that we see. There's this classic spin effects textured flow that um, anyone familiar with Kamatiites will, will know. But the vast majority of Kamatiites are massive flows where they're kind of just porphyritic throughout. And uh, there's, 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 no, um, there's no distinct texture between the top and the bottom of the flow. Um, we also see thick cumulate dominated flows where you can have potentially tens or hundreds of meters thick accumulations of olivine with just like a, a little hat of spin effects sitting on top. And finally, the very rare, but there is some evidence of volcanic clastic Um this, this change between spin effects textured and massive can occur within a flow. And you can see that in the, in the figure on the bottom left. Um, this is from Antetel 1977. And uh, you can see a spin effects zone growing in along the length of the flow. Um, how do spin effects form? Well, the most important thing is that it's not quenching or rapid cooling. And I think this is really commonly mistaken. Um, again, thinking about the scale, that to get crystals up to a meter in size, this cannot be happening through very rapid crystallization. It takes, it takes a while to grow crystals this big. It's also important to, to note that you do find uh, platy spin effects quite deep into flows where the cooling rate should be pretty low on the order of a degree per hour or, or somewhere in that ballpark. So there's a lot of debate exactly about how spin effects form, but the, the, the one that Nick and I settled on and that we think there's the best evidence for is um, essentially the, the random spin effects at the top um, is coming from, from fairly rapid cooling. There's, there's quenching and you get a, a sort of chill margin. And then uh, underneath you, you start to grow these dendritic olivines. And then what happens um, is because you're growing olivine from the flow top, you actually create this zone that is um, depleted in olivine components. And so you can only crystallize more olivine with a fair bit of undercooling. And this starts to give you skeletal textures. Um, as these crystals grow down into a sort of more olivine rich liquid underneath, um, eventually only the ones that are vertically orientated can continue to grow without colliding with the other crystals. And so we get this platy spin effects where everything is aligned deeper in the flow. Um, it's really important to note that this only happens if there's a thermal gradient. And uh, there's some really nice experiments by Fourier et al. 2006 that, that show this. And you also need to clear out the phenocyst crisp from the lava first, because if you have any olivine phenocyst there, then the um, olivine will just grow on top rather than forming these uh, long skeletal spin effects. Um, and I just wanted to try and get people thinking in 3D, because often we find these as, you know, belly deformed, or they might be vertical uh, kind of slices through Archean greenstone belts. So, um, this uh, figure on the right is from a really great study by uh, Hill et al. 1995, 
And this is uh, discussing Kamatiax as a, as a flow field concept. And I think this is based on some uh, observations from more recent flood basalts. And so when we look at these um, flow fields and, and map them out in a bit more detail, most spin effects is actually found in small flows on the margins of large eruptions or uh, in lava lakes. And so it may be that you need some sort of ponding uh, or, or low flow rate in the lava, both to allow crystals to settle out um, and also to develop thermal gradients. If you have a large turbulently flowing lava flow, then the, there's not really going to be a thermal gradient in there. It'll all be essentially the same temperature. Uh, there's also the possibility that you need some upstream deposition of phenocrysts in some of these kind of thick cumulate dominated flows to get a relatively phenocryst poor flow around the margins that you can get spin effects texture in. So the important thing here is that spin effects is diagnostic of Kamatiite because you need an ultramafic, um, you know, more than 18 weight percent MGO liquid to be crystallizing olivine spin effects, but it's not necessarily required. And so this has led to definitions where, where um, for example, Kiranant defined Kamatiax as either lavas with olivine spin effects or rocks that can be directly related to them. Okay. We're not the first to note that Kamatiaks are primarily an Archean phenomenon. Um, and actually, even if, if we if we zoom in more than that, the, the vast majority of occurrences are about 2.7 billion years old. Um, they are rare in the Proterozoic and Phanerozoic, say from a, a couple of examples, and they're completely absent in the Eoarchean, which I think is a really interesting um, issue that hasn't really been addressed yet. Um, on the plot here, I've just shown the number of analyses from the GROC database that have been tagged as Kamatiite. Now, this is a really, really imperfect proxy for the volume of Kamatiite, and obviously um, the database is going to be massively biased towards famous localities. And I just want to highlight here that the 3.5 billion year old peak here is overwhelmingly Kamati formation samples from the, uh, the type of locality of Kamatiite. So it's definitely oversampled. Um, so what we did to try and get around this is we um, actually normalized these the the just the raw volume of, of analyses to the um, detrital zircon record, and so we, we're using detrital zircon here to either measure peaks in crustal production or survival. And what you can see is that actually because of such a large crustal production or or preservation peak at two point seven billion years ago. Um, when we normalize the, uh, the number of analyses, you can see that Kamatiaks were not unusually common at 2.7 billion years old uh, ago. And part of this peak just comes from the fact that there's more crust at that age. Um, geographically, Kamatiaks are found in almost every Archean craton. Um, there's a couple of notable exceptions. The first one is the North Atlantic craton. Um, and second that I'm going to talk about is the Slave craton. So um, there's Possibility here that these had uh, Kamatiaks to begin with, but there's a there's a preservation issue, and so a couple of um, a couple of ideas of, of whether these may have had Kamatia originally or not. Um, we looked at uh, detrital chromites from the Slave Craton, and uh, there's also been some work, even though Kamatiaks are known from the Cat file, looking at detrital chromites there. And if you analyze the composition of these chromites, you can actually uh, find Kamatiatic chromite compositions. So this su suggests there were more Kamatiaks around that have been completely eroded away or since tectonically destroyed. And the only records we, we find of them are in these um, uh, sedimentary rocks uh, in heavy mineral layers full of detrital chromite. Um, in the North Atlantic craton, I think the big difference here between the North Atlantic and other cratons is that there's a very, very deep erosional level. So we don't really see many greenstone belts. And uh, the, the, the one that we, we do most famously is Ishua, and that's, that's Eoarchean, so there's no Kamatiites. Um, but what we do see in these uh, deeply uh, deeply eroded crustal sections is that the regional um, orthonices are absolutely full of these ultramafic intrusions. Um, and I've shown a map on the right from uh, Chadwick and Crew 1986, and you can see every black dot on there is an ultramafic intrusion. At least some of these appear to have Kamatiatic origins. They're basically pure olivine dunites and, and some with the uh, chromatite layers, although those are pretty rare. Um, yeah, and so it's possible that actually we did have feeder systems for Kamatiites, but the Kamatiites were completely eroded off the top of the craton. Um, something that's, I think, quite important to, to note, and, and this is a, it's going to be an issue with all of, the, uh, all of the models that I present later, so I'm just going to address it off the bat, um, is that Kamatiites are really volumetrically minor. Um, so they're pretty ubiquitous, you find them in almost every craton, but they're very rare. Um, if we say maybe 10% of every craton is made up of greenstone belt, 
and about 10% on average of greenstone belts are made up of komatiite, then komatiites only represent 1% of the overall Archean rock record. Um, they're always associated with tholeotic basalts, and these tholeotic basalts are present in much larger volumes typically. And I think this could be a clue to what's going on. So later in the talk, I'm going to argue that komatiites come from uh, form as high degree melts with very, very long melting columns. So there should be very, very large volumes of komatiite produced. So where did it all go? A um, couple of options here. The first one is that these komatiaks might stall in uh, crustal or even uh, below the moho lithospheric magma chambers and basically differentiate uh, to give you both tholeotic basalts, which we see erupted at the surface, and ultramafic cumulates that we see in the North Atlantic craton and, and maybe some others. Um, the other option is just that these ultramafic rocks have a really low preservation potential. They're very easy to weather, erode, and um, they're dense, so they can be recycled either through subduction or delam delamination. So maybe we have a situation where um, a combination of this preservation issue uh, and basically if a komatiite can get to the surface uh, rapidly, then you see a komatiite, and if it stalls and differentiates, then we see the tip basalt. Okay, komatiite geochemistry. Um, Komatiites have long been classified based on uh, variations in garnet signature. Um, and what I mean by garnet signature is residual garnet in, in the mantle source. So we identify garnet in the mantle sources by aluminium and heavy rare earth depletion. So the three main groups um, have often uh, traditionally been defined on this uh, plot of gadolinium over terbium. So that's a middle rare earth over a heavy rare earth uh, against aluminium over titanium. And the three, three main groups are aluminium depleted komatiites, or ADK as I'll call, uh, have them a lot on the slides. Um, these have residual garnet, so they are enriched in middle rare earths over heavy rare earths, and they are depleted in aluminium over titanium. We have aluminium undepleted uh, komatiites, or AUK. Uh, these don't have any residual garnet, and so they plot close to the uh, bulk earth composition, um, which is uh, noted by these the, the dashed lines in this plot. And finally, we have aluminium enriched komatiites. And in the past, these were often described as having garnet enriched sources. But actually, if we look in detail, we can see that the, the high aluminium over titanium ratios actually reflects titanium depletion more than excess aluminium. So um, I, I will refer to them as aluminium enriched komatiites uh, throughout this talk, but just, just bear in mind, these could interchangeably be called titanium depleted komatiites. Um, so this consideration about the titanium depletion being more important shows us that the absolute concentrations of aluminium and titanium are important, and not just the ratios. So in this uh, in this paper, Nick and I came up with this new Komatiak classification, and um, we wanted it to be pretty simple and and quite close to to what previous uh, classifications have used. So the idea here is that you you just um, plot up your Komatiak data along an olivine control line, uh, aluminium and titanium against magnesium. And then you just interpolate or extrapolate to 25 weight percent MGO. Why 25 weight percent? Well, this is kind of where a mode in um, komatiite compositions lies. Um, and the idea here is just to correct for fractional crystallization effects. Um, we then have aluminium depleted komatiites being defined by an aluminium over titanium ratio less than 15, aluminium undepleted between 15 and 25, and aluminium enriched um, above 25. Um, the last thing is uh, we have this fourth group, which are titanium enriched komatiites. And here we just put an arbitrary cutoff of 0.5 weight percent MGO at 25% um, magnesium. Um, it's important to note that with, with some of these titanium enriched komatiites, which are actually quite low in MGO and probably don't technically meet the definition of komatiite, you get artificially low titanium just because you're projecting it so far back down an olivine control line. So that's the Boston Creek flow that I've uh, mentioned in the slide. Um, the figure on the right is just showing how those interpolation extrapolation works. And you can see here that actually when we compare aluminium depleted komatiites from the komati formation in uh, Barberton in the Catfile Craton and uh, aluminium enriched komatiites from Velta Braden, there's actually no difference in the, in the absolute amount of aluminium. It's just that all the uh, Velta Braden samples light to higher MGO. Um, and the big thing there is that Velta Braden has much, much lower titanium than the, uh, the alum so aluminium enriched have much, much lower titanium, sorry. Okay, um, I really wanna highlight that uh, Komatiaks have a very wide range of tracement patterns, 
Um, aluminium enriched chromatiates, and in particular these common dale uh, aluminium enriched chromatiates from South Africa, extend to the most depleted bulk melt compositions observed on Earth. Um, these are just insanely depleted. Um, on the flip side, titanium enriched chromatiates, and again, uh, picking out the Boston Creek flow from uh, Abitibi in Canada here, uh, these extend to uh, really quite highly enriched trace limit patterns for ultramafic rocks. And, and we've summarized these trace element patterns on a plot of uh, gadolinium over terbium again. So this is measuring the garnet signature uh, against lanthanum over samarium. So that's light rare earth over middle rare earth. And the idea there is to, is to measure source depletion. So what you can see from this plot is there's this, this very wide range of um, source compositions and melting styles implied by this. We, uh, the, the presence or absence of res residual garnet is telling us something about the pressure. Um, and potentially the temperature. And the um, lanthanum uh, samarium ratio is telling us about the level of source depletion. And we just have like a, a, real, a real range here. Um, and again, you can see all of the aluminum enriched ones here plot to highly depleted compositions. Um, and I just want to strike a note of caution here that if we try and use Comartiax to trace mantle geochemistry, and there's, there's I've shown a slide from uh, Puck Tell 2022. 20, uh, it's not, not to pick on them. There is a, a, a cottage industry in basically measuring some geochemical parameter in Comartiax through Earth history, plotting it up, and then saying this is this is mantle variations. So we be, need to be really, really careful when we're comparing across different Comartiax from different parts of Earth history like this, because these Comartiax potentially have different sources, different melting conditions, and they may not be representative of the whole mantle at the age that they erupt. Um, so are there some temporal trends? Um, just, just a little something that we noticed is that regardless of whether there's a garnet signature or not, if you look at Comartiax that are older than about 3 billion years old, then both the aluminium depleted and the aluminium undepleted Comartiax have quite flat trace element patterns. Um, after 3 billion years, um, aluminium enriched Comartiax basically disappear. Um, and we also stop seeing, I, I call them true aluminium depleted Comartiax here. Um, this is something that people had thought in the past, but then it was kind of counter-argued that there were some younger aluminium depleted comartiates. But most of these have relatively low uh, MGO contents below this 18% cutoff. So it's questionable whether this should be classed as comartiates or not. Um, below 3 billion years ago, we also see a consistent depleted morb-like trace element pattern in the aluminium undepleted comartiates. And so I'm not really sure what this is telling us, just to throw an idea out there, potentially we're starting to evolve um, depleted mantle um, during this time, and it takes a while to get it uh, recycled down to deep depths where commodities originate from. All right, next I'll run through some uh, constraints on commodity formation. And so the reason we did this is uh, when we started out writing this paper, uh, Nick and I didn't agree on much. So basically, um, my idea was to put all of the models up there, and then we just start knocking them out one by one. Um, and so the main things we're going to use to discriminate between some of these models are water contents, uh, melting pressure and temperature, and um, just a bit of a consideration about how melts migrate in the mantle. So just to briefly run through all these models, I split them into plume and non-plume. Uh, plume models are such a big part of it because I'd say these are still the prevailing models for Comartiate formation and have been right back since Comartiate were first discovered. Um, in terms of non-plume models, we have some uh, ideas that Comartiates formed in subduction zones and that potentially uh, flux melting and water allows you to create these ultramafic melts at lower temperatures than we might otherwise need. Um, there's a couple of non-uniformitarian models, and what I mean by this are tectonic scenarios that don't exist on the modern Earth. Um, one I'm not really going to go into detail on is the idea that Comartiates formed as impact melts. The reason I won't talk about this is just because it's not really seriously considered at this point. Um, there's the idea that uh, Comartiates form in response to delamination. So you have um, dense residues delaminating from a craton, and in return, you have some sort of upwards uh, uh, return flow, and that upwelling creates mel mantle melting. The subduction uh, model says either just straight up that they form in a subduction zone similar to bononites, or that there's some kind of uh, melting through a slab window. We have an idea from um, Hertzberg 2016 that Comartiax formed in uh, carbonated wet spots, either in ambient mantle or in plumes. And then in terms of plume models, we have um, 
various ideas about how much water content there is in the plumes. Are they damp or dry? Um, we have different ideas of the depth of plume. Uh, do they come from the transition, the mantle transition zone, or do they come from the core mantle boundary? And um, what is the melting style? Do they form by critical melting or by batch melting? Um, and I'll go into most of these in, in, in more detail. So were Comartex wet? Um, this has been argued about a lot, and particularly around the, the turn of the millennium. There was a, there's a lot of discussion about this. So I'm just going to focus on things that have come out since then. And the big advance is um, melt inclusion studies. And just to show you what some of these melt inclusions look like, these are melt inclusions from the Belingue Comartites from Asapov et al. 2018. And they are remarkably preserved. These are 2.7 billion year old melt inclusions and um, just really, really lovely, well-preserved melt inclusions there. So looking at Archean Comartites, um, most of the published studies find that there is some water in these and it's between about 0.2 and 0.6 weight percent. Um, in terms of CO2 contents, there's a, not very much CO2 at all, 7 to 200 ppm. But this is likely a minimum because CO2 begins degassing at such high pressures So um, compared to water, so probably lost some. And when you calculate equilibration pressures for these, you get about one kilometer depth. Um, Gorgona, which is the kind of only widely accepted Phanerozoic Comartiite, has higher water contents between 0.2 and 1 weight percent, and more CO2 between about 300 and 1700 ppm with an equilibration pressure of about 2.5 kilometers. The other big advance has been um, thermometers that are independent of water contents. And um, most notably, these are the aluminum and olivine um, thermometer, which works on aluminum exchange between olivine and chromite, and the scanium yttrium thermometer. Um, so these are consistent with fairly uh, like dry or, or damp melt evolutions. And I've got a couple of plots on the right. And what, what these are showing is a plot of temperature against the olivine forced right content. And essentially, you can plot out curves for how you'd expect this uh, to evolve if you had a completely dry liquid, um, one with a bit more water, um, or, or one that's fairly wet. And the top one from Sobel et al. 2016, I think is particularly good because they um, they show a comparison to bononites that we, we know are wet. And you can see that in the bononites, which are these purple squares, then the temperature falls more rapidly with, um, with the force drive content. And this is just because as olivine is crystallizing, the water is increasing in the melt. But in Comartiax, by comparison, we start off with a little bit of water um, in this about 0.5%, 0.6%. And as this degasses, you end up on a dry melting trend. I've also put one of my own plots because this, this was from my first paper as a PhD student, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, came up with this plot independently, but got, got beat into it by Sobolev. And you can see here, um, the dry curve is this one labeled 0 0.90. This is just to show different um, iron oxidation states. And most of the data falls along this curve. The only ones that don't are ones that show very, very low iron magnesium equilibration temperatures with olivine. So these have had a lot of low temperature exchange. And so the temperature is probably being artificially depressed a bit. OK, so there has been an argument that um, potentially there was more water in the primary melt uh, of Comartiax and then this degassed and uh, escaped before we made these melt inclusions. But I would argue that if the melts had degassed earlier, because you have this rapid lowering of, uh, of the liquidus temperature, then this should force olivine crystallization and we should trap some of these melt inclusions. And we can see this in mon bononites and mimakites, and both of these have olivine melt inclusions with up to 4% water. Um, so I think if there was water, more water in Comartiax, we should be able to see it somewhere. So on the whole, most Comartiacs are dry or damp, and there's a few rare exceptions. Again, this Boston Creek unit, which is a bit weird, um, has some amphibole, igneous amphibole in there. So um, we've already crossed out impact melts, uh, and that allows us to cr cross out all of the models that are subduction related or need a fair amount of water in them. So next we'll talk about the temperatures. Um, for dry high magnesium melts, the liquidus temperature is proportional to the magnesium content. So basically, for every one weight percent MGO you go up, the liquidus temperature increases by about 20 degrees. So um, when we apply this to our key and and again, correcting for these small amounts of water, we get liquidus temperatures of between about 1450 and 600, uh, 1600 degrees C. Uh, for protrazoic comartiates, although they're rarer, we get uh, temperatures between 1450 and 1550. 
And um, Phanerozoic, uh, this is just the Gorgona and Comartia, so we get temperatures between 1330 and 1400. It's important to note here that um, obviously this is just one locality, um, but there are higher temperature pyprites in the Phanerozoic um, that don't necessarily class as Comartiates. To ask if there's a plume or not, we want to ask not just how hot is the melt, but is there a thermal anomaly in the mantle? And so the easiest way to do this is to calculate mantle potential temperatures. Um, and this basically is, is a, a reference frame for comparing how hot the mantle is, where you project it up to the surface along the solid adiabat, and then you can compare temperatures, ignoring the fact that it's changing uh, as the mantle decompresses or, or changes uh, between different pressures. So I said this is the easiest way to do it, but this is really complex and there's some massive uncertainties. So two of the um, two of the most prominent ways of doing this. The first one is to project the liquidus temperature back to the solidus. And then basically we say, okay, what mantle adiabat do I need to inter intersect this uh, the solidus at this depth? Now, this is a bit of a mess because if you think about what we're doing, we have a, a melt of the surface with a, uh, and we know it's liquidus temperature. We then have to project it down along a liquid adiabat until the pressure that we think it se segregated from the source. We then have to project it down along a mush adiabat, um, including corrections for the fact that the temperature is dropping as melting in, uh, continues. And we need to get it all the way back down to the solidus. And this gets really difficult because um, once you get to higher pressures, the, um, the solidus and adiabat are, are almost parallel. So basically, tiny differences in either the liquidus temperature or the assumptions that you make can make huge differences in the potential temperature and the pressure of melting that you infer. Another method is to use um, MGO isoplets, and this is um, based on Claude Hertzberg's work. And basically, um, he noted a, a long while ago that um, the magnesium content of, of near solidus melts um, depends on the pressure of melting initiation. And then once you started melting, you actually, the, the magnesium content doesn't change very much. And the reason for this is the mantle is getting, um, the mantle is getting more depleted. Um, and so it is, it, it's the, the residue is more MGO rich, but the pressure of melting is dropping. And so the melts coming from that are, are taking in less MGO uh, preferentially. So then again, if you can figure out what the pressure of uh, melting initiation was, this depends on the potential temperature and the, the adiabat that, uh, where it intersected the solidus. So putting all this together, you get Archean Comartia potential temperatures of about 1700 to 1900 degrees C. Now, obviously take these with a grain of salt, but I think combining the liquidus temperatures and the potential temperatures, because the liquidus temperatures of, of Archean Comartia range up to the higher than the, um, the maximum suggested mantle potential, ambient mantle potential temperature, we can be pretty sure that we need a thermal anomaly like plume. So plumes are required. So um, that will uh, let us cross out all of these non-plume models. I'm just gonna add a quick note about the mantle solidus. There is ongoing debate about what exactly it looks like at high pressure. And um, looking at what, what I call here traditional uh, solidus, these, this is based on older experiments, and we get relatively high temperatures. But more recent work by uh, Dennis Andro and um, Pierre Etal in uh, 2022 um, find that you actually, um, they, they found a much lower temperature solidus. And basically there's a trade-off. If the solidus is high temperature, then we get relatively shallow melting, although this is still quite deep. Um, and if the solidus is low, then we need much, much deeper melting. Um, we use the older solidus for a couple of reasons. Um, when we were trying to model this, we couldn't get Comartiax to the surface hot enough using this lower temperature solidus to match the observed liquidus temperatures. Um, and also with these new experiments, then high MGO contents were only reached at very, very high degrees of melting that don't match what we see from the trace elements. But I just want to add the caveat that if I um, if this new solidus is right, then everything I say after this point is going to be completely wrong. So um, just bear with me on that one. Okay, next. Um, Looking at the extent of melting, um, Comartiates have very, very low trace element contents, and this implies that they are high degree melts. To calculate the exact extent of melting, we used uh, titanium, which is a moderately incompatible element. And the reason we use this is because it's not affected by garnet residue in the source, and it's less affected by um, uh, source depletion. So um, 
just running some simple calculations, you get melting extents of about 30 to 45 percent for aluminium depleted commartiites, and up to 43 percent melting for aluminium undepleted commartiites. But just bear in mind that these younger ones have a depleted mantle source, so it's already had a couple of percent uh, melt removed from it. The exception here is the Barberton aluminium undepleted commartiites, and we have no idea what's going on with these. Um, the titanium contents are extremely low and very, very similar to primitive mantle itself. And so if you just do this kind of um, simple melting calculation, you get 80 to 90% melting. And it's honestly really hard to imagine how that happens on Earth. So we're not really sure what's happening with these. There is an alternative proposal for how you get these low trace element contents. And that is that the melting happens in low mantle with residual calcium perovskite. This idea comes from Mackenzie 2020. And he argued that the low trace element contents of Kamatiak could be explained by, uh, by residual calcium perovskite. But the problem we have with this is that calcium perovskite causes a large fractionation of the rare earth elements, which are pretty compatible in calcium perovskite, from the high field strength elements. This is a bit offset by the fact that you have the opposite relation in, uh, in magnesium perovskite, uh, bridgmanite. But um, you would basically need all Kamatiaks to form with the ex exact ratio that this just cancelled out, and, and it, it seems kind of unlikely. Um, the other observation is that uh, at pressures higher than about 7 gigapascals, which is a couple of hundred kilometers depth, um, the mantle becomes saturated in metal. And so any melts coming from much deeper than this should be basically devoid of highly siderophile elements because they should all stay in the metal phase. And um, so low mantle melts should have very, very low highly siderophile element concentrations. This is the opposite of what we see. Kamatiites actually have higher um, highly siderophile element concentrations than any other melt um, that we see, uh, almost any other melt on Earth. So I think it's um, I think it's very unlikely that we have this. Either the melting was happening in the upper mantle, or if they're lower mantle melts, there has to be something that kind of erases that uh, lower mantle geochemical signature. Okay. So we crossed out low mantle melting with the calcium perovskite. Um, the next thing to address is whether Kamatiaks are batch melts. And for anyone who works on uh, shallow mantle uh, melting, then this would probably be a bit of a, of a weird thing to consider. Um, so wh where this comes from, basically liquids are more compressible than uh, solids. And so as you go down in depth in the mantle, the density of liquids increases at a faster rate than the, um, the solids around them. So there's potentially a small window where kamatiatic melt becomes more dense than the mantle. And this is a, a figure that Nick redrew from, uh, from older work. And, and basically with, with the older work, depending on the assumptions you make, there, there can be a bigger density overlap. But if we follow this kamatiatic melt back, there's this tiny little window around the olivine wadsley transition where the melt is, is probably a bit denser than the solid. Um, so the idea uh, for batch melting was people were suggesting that maybe because the density is so similar, the liquids and solids can essentially travel together and you have continued melting without the liquid segregating and escaping as it would in the shallow mantle. The problem here is that commartiate viscosities at high pressures are insanely low. Um, so about five to 100 millipascal seconds. And I think water is about one millipascal second. So that gives you an idea of just how runny these are. So this means as soon as you have any small density difference, the melt will segregate very easily and migrate upwards. Um, however, um, even though we think we can rule out batch melting by this method, uh, by, by this consideration, sorry. Um, if you do have a high melt fraction beneath this olivine water layer transition, the fact that the density difference drops very, very rapidly can essentially cause a traffic jam of melt. And I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> So we've ruled out batch melting models. So basically what we're left with is that Kamatiites uh, form by critical melting. Um, they are dry or damp melts. We have no evidence for flux, flux melting or subduction zones. Uh, they form at high temperatures, so we need a mantle plume. They're high degree melts. And they either form in the upper mantle or the signatures of low mantle melting were removed. Um, and because they form as critical melts, we need some way of efficiently mixing melts uh, that are formed over a large depth range. Now, we can't really say where these plumes are coming from because we think, because the geochemical signatures are upper mantle, we can't be sure whether we have core mantle boundary plumes or transition zone plumes. But um, I think this is a, a, a pretty good like uh, range of constraints that we can put on it. Uh, 
So let's move on to some models for their formation. Um, I'll start with aluminium depleted commartiates because these have the best constraints on the melting pressure. So again, moving back to this idea of the MGO content of near solid this melts, aluminium uh, depleted commartiates have about 38% MGO. And this implies that the melting starts at very high pressures, greater than or equal to 10 gigapascals, which is about 300 kilometers. Now, because we're retaining a garnet signature in the melts, we need to segregate the melts before we hit the garnet out curve and also but after we reach about 30% melting. And this depends a lot on what phase relations you, you use, but um, this means that essentially the melts have to segregate at a minimum of seven gigapascals or a couple of hundred kilometers. So on the um, figure on the right, you can see um, this is a temperature pressure phase diagram for the, the, the mantle. Um, you can see uh, present day ambient mantle and note that there's these little steps um, in the major mineral transitions. <laughs> And the present day mantle has a potential temperature about 1300 degrees C. If we move back to the Archean and um, much, much higher potential temperatures, if we have a potential temperature around 1800, this will cross the solidus at around uh, 10 or 11 gigapascals, giving us our 38% MGO. And um, it can just about reach the 30% melting uh, curve before we hit this garnet outline. So therefore it's, um, it's possible to generate a commartiate with low aluminium mode titanium and very, very high MGO with high degrees of melting um, and keep that garnet signature. Um, if we have temperatures much higher than this, it actually gets a little confusing because um, the projecting back from where the melt would have segregated, you know, 30% melting before the garnet out curve, you actually hit this olivine wadsley transition before you hit the solidus. Um, and so it's really, really not sure what's, what would happen here, whether there's melts in the transition zone, whether melts would actually be freezing in the transition zone or continued melting. But either way, probably somewhere in this ballpark of potential temperatures, you can actually hit all of these constraints. So what causes the melt to segregate? And bear in mind, we need the melt to remain quite isolated from the surrounding mantle, because otherwise further melting will introduce um, melts which don't have this garnet signature and erase it from our aluminium depleted commartiates. So we came up with a couple of models for this. The first one is this uh, shallow, still really deep, but shallow melting model where melting starts around 11 gigapascals, corresponding to the 1800 degrees C potential temperature in this figure. Um, then basically, um, as, as the melt, uh, melting continues and melt fraction increases, there might come a point where the melts become quite channelized. And if we have these quite large channels, then they might be quite well um, insulated from further melting going around. And then the melts become very well mixed and give us this, uh, this aluminium depleted commartio. Um, the alternative model is that if the melting did start very deep and potentially um, in the lower mantle or below the transition zone, then as the melt fraction uh, increases and we hit the olivine wads layout boundary, we get this traffic jam effect. So there's a massive increase in porosity as the density difference um, decreases and we get a huge spike in melt fraction. And then the idea here is that as this uh, density difference um, increases again um, past the transition, then the melt would escape as these large pulses. And then these are again, effectively isolated from the surrounding mantle. For aluminium uh, undepleted commartiates, we don't have such good pressure constraints. Um, these kind of commartiates are, are generally the ones that there's been a bit of water found in the melt inclusions. And so what this means is that pretty much regardless of the temperature, as you leave the transition zone and cross the uh, what's the olivine transition, you'll get a little bit of minor hydrous melting. And we're not really sure what would happen with these melts. Maybe they escape upwards, maybe they get incorporated uh, later, or maybe it, this melting isn't enough to fully dehydrate the commartiate and, and you retain a bit of water that is, is then what we're measuring at the surface. But then uh, there's no melting until, no significant melting until you hit the dry solidus. And because these have um, generally between about 27 and 38% MGO for, for kind of true Archean aluminium undepleted commartiates. Um, this would imply that the major melting um, starts at pressures of higher than eight gigapascals. And again, it can be up to up to 11, same ballpark as, uh, as the aluminium depleted. Um, for younger aluminium undepleted commartiates and all Proterozoic and Phanerozoic commartiates fit, in, uh, fit into this group, 
then we obviously have shallower uh, pressures, lower MGO contents. Um, yeah. Um, now, for these younger Comartiates, we don't have a lot of uh, an idea of where these melts would necessarily segregate. Um, we need to melt past garnet out to get rid of the garnet signature. But after you, um, at low pressures, after you melt past garnet out, you still have a residue of Hartsburgite, olivine plus OPX. And so you can actually carry on melting. At high pressures, it's quite different. And the reason for this is that um, garnet is the next mineral down from olivine uh, from the liquids. So when you go from melting garnet plus olivine uh, to just uh, pass garnet out, you're, you're basically trying to melt pure olivine uh, donite composition. And this is the melt productivity drops tremendously. And so melting effectively ceases at the garnet out curve. So for these high pressure ones, we can be fairly sure that whatever, um, sorry, these high temperature, high pressure ones, um, when they start melting, they cross the solidus and then they basically stop melting at garnet out. And for the younger, lower temperature, lower pressure ones, they might continue melting past this point. We're not quite sure. Um, so this is a, a kind of a common uh, idea is that aluminium underpleted commodities, because they lack a garnet signature, they have uh, they are lower pressure than aluminium depleted. And I kind of want to dispel this a bit. It's, it's probably true for the younger ones. Um, as, as long as you melt past garnet out, there's going to be uh, lower lower pressure of melt segregation. But for the for the um, the high MGO ones, the pressure of melting initiation is actually probably quite similar to an aluminium depleted commartiate. And the only difference is that the extent of melting is higher, such that you completely exhaust garnet in the source. And again, the pressure of melt segregation can be really deep because you might be hitting this garnet out curve. Um, at past 180 kilometers or six gigapascals. Um, in terms of aluminium enriched commartiates, again, these are ultra depleted um, melts. They have ultra depleted sources. And the, the, the latest um, modeling shows that these sources are probably similar to protonic Hartsburgite, or you could have some sort of um, uh, commartiate coming from deeper and having extreme melt rock reaction with Hartsburgite. Because the sources are so depleted, it's possible to get higher MGO contents in the melt at lower pressures of melting. And we really don't have a good idea of the pressures because both the solidus and, and the melt compositions produced from a hot baguette source are very poorly constrained. But we do have some evidence that some of these are coming from very, very uh, great depths. And um, particularly the Commondale Comartiates, these have probably some of the most, uh, if not the most, high aluminium olivines ever found on earth. And this is up to 0.3 weight percent. So as I mentioned before, aluminium and olivine is, is a thermometer. And basically um, you can only get such high uh, aluminium contents at very, very high temperatures and, and actually quite high pressures as well. We also see insanely forced right rich olivines and you can see some uh, picture of these up in the top right corner and some uh, probe spots that were, were taken on one of these grains. And the four strike content gets up to 96%, which is insanely high. Anyway, um, so this is some work by Wilson and Bolhar, 2021, and they uh, found that you can only get these olivine compositions if the olivine is crystallizing at depths greater than 10 gigapascals. And so this is telling us that the melt has to be sourced from deeper than this. We don't know if this applies to all aluminium enriched commartiates, but at least evidence that some of them are derived from very, very deep. And finally, titanium enriched commartiates. Um, these have barely, variably enriched source compositions. They're generally lower in magnesium than other commartiates. And this high titanium um, can either be explained by low degrees of melting uh, or metasomatized sources. And I think the best uh, analog for these are these basically like a, a ferroprocritic origin. So this is relatively low um, temperatures melting at relatively low pressures. And this diagram, I think I missed the attribution, but it's from Stonatel 1995. And uh, here you can see this is their model for where aluminium underpleted commartiates are forming, and uh, their model for, uh, sorry, commartiates is similar to these uh, pick rights. So uh, pressures lower than five gigapascals or about 150 kilometers depth. So just to summarize everything that I've said there, <laughs> aluminium depleted commartiates have fertile sources. Uh, they have hot, uh, they're very, very hot, high pressure uh, pressures of melting initiation greater than about 300 kilometers depth. They must segregate before you reach garnet exhaustion to keep that garnet signature. And the ideas we came up with is either they become isolated in channels 
or large pulses that are formed after crossing this olivine water the transition. And they need relatively high degrees of melting, 30 to 45 percent. Aluminium undepleted komatiites, the old ones have fertile sources, the young ones have depleted mantle sources. Um, they also have uh, hot and deep uh, melting initiation, um, at least greater than 8 gigapascal, some of them greater than about 10. Um, and either shallow melt segregation or we have deep segregation at the point where we cross the garnet out curve. Uh, we don't need to isolate the melts because we don't have to preserve a garnet signature in these. And they show similarly high degrees of melting uh, with the possibility that some of them, this barbiton aluminium under pleated comatia, extend to much, much higher uh, melt fractions. But again, we don't know what's going on there. Aluminium enriched comatiacs have refract hi refractory, highly depleted sources, or they strongly interact with cratonic Hartsbergite on the way up. Um, the pressures of melting initiation are pretty uncertain, but at least common ale has very, very high pressures uh, and originates from more than 300 kilometers depth. And then titanium enriched, very uh, variably enriched sources, and then ferropic bright light. Okay, I think that's all I had to say. Oh, yeah. So um, going through this review, we think there's a lot of unanswered questions going forward. Um, so this is by no means the last word on commartiates. Um, the first thing is that people need to sort out the high pressure mantle solidness and come to an agreement on that because that is, is fundamental to so many of these uh, models. Um, we need a better understanding of how melts migrate and segregate uh, through the deep mantle. Um, we need to further look into how melt rock interaction modifies Comartia compositions uh, on the way to the surface. Because, I mean, if these are traveling uh, such from such great depths, there's bound to be something happening to them on the way up. And then the kind of more esoteric question of like, what, what does a mantle capable of producing these extremely high temperatures melts actually look like? What does that mean for tectonics and everything else that's going on in the Archean? And finally, this um, huge reduction in Comartia abundance after 2.7 uh, billion years ago, what does it mean? And um, how do we reconcile this with the fact that some modern pickwrights still have really, really high temperatures? Okay, thank you very much.